How's it going, everybody? Brian Alvers and Dave Meltzer here, Wrestling Observer Radio, November 3rd, 2024, figure4online.com slash wrestlingobserver.com. we got a lot of news to get into today, including a WWE pay-per-view crown jewel. We have new crown jewel champions, which... Uh, they didn't even get to keep their belts. No, these are gigantic, gaudy belts. They They actually explained what the belts were made of. And uh, given this is Saudi Arabia and the belts are going to be kept in vaults afterwards, I believe 100% that these are the most expensive belts ever created in the history of wrestling. And I'm sure the crown prince paid for them. And uh, he's not letting them leave. But yes, the winners were presented with the belts. But the belts stay at the WWE Experience in Riyadh. And the winners will be getting Super Bowl-style giant rings. And Hunter said it's going to be like an annual thing, and I guess we'll find out who can collect the most rings over the years. And, uh, yeah, these are ridiculous gaudy belts. Ridiculous. Well, I'm sure that if they are, then, uh, you know, the boxing belts, if they start making boxing belts, they'll make, you know, even more expensive belts because yeah. they spend a lot more money on their boxing than they do on their wrestling. As much as they spend on their wrestling, which is a lot. And everyone's doing that now. Well, everyone in the Middle East, you know, Abu Dhabi and, and uh, um, you know, Saudi Arabia. And um, it's probably going to up the ante for other countries, too, you know, when it comes to these. But, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it's probably going to wind up doing that for boxing and MMA. It's great for their business. Well, what did you think of this pay-per-view? Um, I thought that it was... Um, it was an easy to watch show. I didn't think that there was anything special at all on the show. It was just kind of like there. Um, the uh, you know the, the the booking I would say is was was predictable, which isn't necessarily bad. I mean, like in the opening match, I was surprised that they had uh, Roman Reigns lose the fall and not Jimmy Uso. But uh, um, I think that that sounds like that they're going to do a real big Roman Reigns solo Sokoa match. And probably Roman Reigns, Jacob Fatu match as well. But the Solo Sokoa match seems to be the one that they're going to make as the big one because he's the one that got the pin. And um, so, you know, and they, you know, they got Sami Zayn involved, which it, it's like every single person in the building knew that that was going to happen. Um, and then the, you know, as far as Cody Rhodes and Gunther, I thought they had, the, I thought Cody Rhodes and Gunther had the best match. But it was, it was a by the books match. It was a WWE. Um, pay-per-view main event, you kick out of each other's finisher, and then, you know, you do something. And um, in this case, Cody Rhodes got the win when he reversed the choke, um, or cradle got a, a basically a cradle off the choke, which is a spot that they do, you know, in almost every Shayna Baszler match for an ear fall. So I just figured this is an ear fall, but it was a, an actual pin, you know, gotten from, you know, the Bret Hart, Roddy Piper match at WrestleMania, I believe, seven um, okay. And they actually did the exact same spot in the Mariah May Anna J match on Collision. Yeah, they did. They did. Yeah, but it's, 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 it, that spot gets done all the time. I mean, it's like a normal spot, but it, it's never. It's like never a pin. But in this match, it was the pin. And then, as far as the um, the Liv Morgan and Nia Jax match, a lot of interference. I mean, it was the interference was what it was. I really thought that that match was. Um, Mm, not so good at all, really. I mean, the interference just got silly, and um, the way the match was worked, I mean, like, within, like, a few minutes of the match, I mean, and it was also a short match, um, but within a few minutes of the match, I mean, it was so obvious that, like, Nia Jax was just killing her constantly, so it was kind of like, they're not going to, like, have the person, they're not going to have one of their world champions get killed this decisively and made look so uncompetitive, unless they're winning, and that's exactly what happened. And, you know, Dominic got involved, and Raquel Rodriguez got involved, and um, I'm sure that Rhea Ripley probably would have been involved, except she's probably not allowed to fly, and uh, it kind of was what it was. Um, but I thought, like, I didn't, like, you know, the L.A. Night match was short but very good, and uh, the women's tag was was pretty good. I thought it was probably better than, other than the, you know, EO Sky slipped off the ropes, big deal. But And L.A. Knight did, too, for that matter. He crotched himself. And then didn't sell it because it wasn't supposed to happen. But um, you know, it was like a, um, it was a good show, but like no big storyline stuff other than the Sami Zayn thing. You know, other than that, it was like from a storyline standpoint, very little uh, move forward. Bronson Reed and Seth Rollins was was good. 
Um, not off the charts or nothing, but it was good. Well, Roman Reigns, Jay and Jimmy versus Solo, Jacob and Tamatanga was the opener. And it was a very simple story match, which was, it starts out with Jimmy and Jay in there doing spots like they're the old Usos again. The crowd wants Roman to get in there. And so Roman wants a tag, but Jay won't tag him. He tags his brother, and his brother's kind of upset about him for that, and that gives the heels the opportunity to cut off Jimmy. So then Jay gets a hot tag, and he runs wild, and then he gets cut off. And so they finally save the Roman Reigns' big hot hand for the end, and he does his big comeback. And there was actually a spot where Solo hit the spike on Roman, and Jimmy was supposed to make the save, but, like, he totally missed his cue, and Roman didn't kick out, and the ref just held up his count, and he said he kicked out. And the crowd didn't turn on him or anything, but it was a total botch. And then we had everybody hitting the big move and everything like that, and then finally, Jacob ends up running over Roman, hits the big moonsault, Solo crawls over, hits the spike, and uh, hits another one, gets the pin. So Solo actually pinned Roman Reigns, as noted. And, uh, yeah, I was not expecting... I figured it was obvious the Bloodline was going over to set up the War Games match, but I didn't expect yeah. Roman to be the guy to do the job, but he did. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I didn't either. The other thing that was interesting... I mean, actually, I thought this match was pretty underwhelming, except I thought Jacob Fatu at the end of the match was great and pretty much... Um, I mean, everybody else, it was just like normal. Like, the Usos didn't didn't do anything special. Roman Reigns was in for a little while. He did a few trademark moves. I mean, he did nothing wrong, but it was just like, it was essentially like a house show match, except for Jacob Fatu, who was working like it was a pay-per-view match. So then afterwards, the Bloodline's going after the baby faces. It's four on three, and they start tearing apart the announce table, and the fans are already singing for Sami Zayn. And, of course, Solo gets a chair, and he wraps it around the neck of... Of, uh, I think it was Jay. It was Jay. Well, it had to be Jay, Jay because for Sammy to save it, they had to, Jay had to be the one in jeopardy. Because yes. Sammy, Sammy likes Jay and doesn't give a shit about the other two. So, of course, Sammy runs out of the ring, and on Raw Monday, they did a segment outside the building where, uh, Jay and Jimmy, Jimmy's supposed, they're, they're both looking for Sammy, and, and, uh, Jay goes up to Jimmy and says, Did you find him yet? And Jimmy goes, Check that out. And turns out that, that uh, Solo and Sammy are having a conversation. So when Sammy comes out of the ring, he gets in the ring, and Solo offers a hug, and Sammy kind of looks back and forth, and then he goes over to give Solo the hug, but instead he gives him the big exploder, and then, of course, all the babyface hit the ring, and they start uh, they start running wild. And so the only guy left in the ring ends up being Solo. So it's it's uh, all of the blood. It's, it's uh, Roman, Jay, Jimmy, and Sammy all in the ring, and Solo's standing there right in the middle. They're all going to kill him. And it ends up with Roman going to spear him right as Sammy goes to do the kick. And so Sammy ends up kicking Roman right in the face as he goes for the spear. And man, it looked like he booted this guy. And so uh, then, of course, you know, Jimmy's screaming at Sammy. Sammy's saying, I didn't mean to do it. So now we got to get these guys on the same page for War Games with yeah, they four weeks, weeks to do it. Yeah, they got a couple weeks to do it. They got to get it to the, you know, but I mean, they by Sammy running in, you already got the match, and obviously the other one is Tama Tonga. So it looks like I mean, um, uh, Tonga Loa was was in the corner, but really didn't do much of anything, um, other than in the post match, you know, he was putting the boots in and everything. But it it look everything looks like a four on four, so um, rather than a five on five. <laughs> So then we had Bianca and Jade versus Io and Kyrie versus Piper and Chelsea versus Lash and Jakara for the women's tag team titles. And I would say the first half of this match was just kind of, it was there. I would say the second half, uh, it didn't end up being pretty decent. And uh, crowd really got into it for the last couple of minutes as well. They were not into it early. And so we got a big train wreck spot there at the end. Jade ended up hitting Chelsea with Jaded. Damage control broke it up. Everybody hits a big move, and then they did this big spot, and Piper ends up accidentally squashing her own partner with a Vader bomb. And then Bianca and Jade hit Piper with a doomsday device and got the pin to retain the women's tag team titles. I like the last couple of minutes. Yeah, I thought the match was good. The... Um... You know, this match, I didn't expect a title change, and I don't think anyone did because it was, like, thrown together at the last minute. This match was the replacement for the um, 
originally scheduled Rhea Ripley and and uh, Raquel uh, Rodriguez match, and uh, so you know it was just there. I guess they just felt that you know we we, we were going to do seven matches, and and when the one match got scrapped, this was the replacement match. So um, you know that was pretty much it. I thought, um, yeah, you know, I mean. Other than the EO Sky slip, which was pretty noticeable, everything was was well done, it was structured pretty well. I mean, it was a it was a pretty good match. So then we had Bronson Reed and Seth Rollins, and this was one of those matches that I thought was a very good match, and the crowd made the match better. They were super hot for this match from the moment these guys came out because they started brawling on the ramp, and it just had great heat the entire match. Lots of chance for Rollins. This is awesome chance, and it was good. Bronson Reed beat the hell out of him for a long time, and uh, they did a it wasn't spot that long because the, the whole match was short. Well, they did a spot early where Bronson immediately lays him out, and he goes up and he hits a tsunami. But instead of covering, he goes for another one, and Seth ends up moving out of the way and hitting a stomp for a near fall. And the crowd was just going crazy for this opening segment. Yeah, well, they did. The, they did their. They each did their big moves, and I mean, they were going at a very fast pace, so you knew. I mean, it was very much worked like it was going to be a very short match. So Reed is beating on him, and he's beating on him, and he hits a superplex, and then finally Seth starts screaming at him. He should have finished me when you had a chance. Slaps him. So Bronson pummels him. He goes for another tsunami, and Seth keeps rolling out of the way, rolling out of the way, rolling out of the way, and finally they end up outside and. Uh, Bronson gets to steps, but Seth ends up chop-blocking him and giving him a curb stomp into the steps. And that might have been, Bronson actually got cut hard way, like above the eye, and he's kind of bleeding everywhere. So yeah. uh, they end up back in the ring. Seth hits a stomp off the top rope, gets the pin. And the story is that even though he got the pin, Bronson just gets up afterwards like a zombie, and Seth kind of flees outside into the into the aisle, and he looks back all confused like, what is this guy, this monster that cannot be killed? So it looks yeah. like they're going to continue on with this feud. Yeah, I got the impression that it was going to that it was going to keep going. Yeah, yeah, which is weird because if it kept going, I thought that, and I think most people thought that Reed would win the first one if it was going to keep going. But they, you know, they did. I mean, they basically established that that Seth can beat him. Um, I guess they didn't establish that Seth can kill him. So I don't know if that means that we're going to go to a you know a gimmick match that's you know something stronger or or what. But it did. It did feel like they were going to keep going, but the first, the next thing is going to be um, on Raw on Monday, which they're doing in Riyadh, where Seth is going to be in a four-way with uh, Priest, Dominic, and Sheamus, going for and with, with the winner getting the shot at Gunther, which I would presume would be at uh, the December 14th Nassau Coliseum, the Saturday Night's Main Event show. Well, then we had Nia Jax and Liv Morgan for the Women's Crown Jewel title. And their claim was that this Crown Jewel belt had 3,273 embedded stones, 50 carats of diamonds, 250 total carat weight, all emeralds, Australian crystals. And this belt is so big. I don't even know how Liv Morgan lifted it up after the match. I mean, the belt's bigger than she is. But uh, this match... I didn't think it was all that great. I mean, I, the, I didn't even think I didn't think it was good at all. I thought I thought it was below average. I just thought it was below average. I didn't see think much of it at all. And they did a whole bunch of run-ins. Well, the I thing is, thought, I thought their wrestling was okay, but yes, they had so many. I mean, it starts out with you know they're going for a little while, and then Tiffany's music hits. They had a double down, and Tiffany comes out, and she wants to cash in, but Nia just gets up and confronts her. And Tiffany says, I swear I wasn't going to cash in on you. I was going to cash in on, on Liv. And Nia tells her, not this time. Get out of here. So, well, the thing is, is, is Nia's been telling her all along to cash in on Liv. I know. So I don't know why she was so upset here. And so yeah. first Tiffany leaves, and then she starts coming back again. And she tries to cash in a second time. And this time, out comes Raquel, and she takes the briefcase away. So Nia's distracted, and Liv hits a diving code breaker. And then Liv and Raquel both go after Tiffany. Nia wipes them all out. Nia then takes out Liv, goes for the Annihilator. Dom then throws the briefcase into the ring. Raquel necks Nia on the ropes, and Liv hits Oblivion for the pin. <laughs> so it's like... I mean, this win really meant something to Liv Morgan because she's like in tears. She's crying she was, after the match. She, she, 
she she was she wasn't she was in tears, but I mean the the whole match of all I mean, the ways to win this first ever, it was like God. There were eighty five people. Like how's a torture match? Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, yeah. It it it, it was weird that they would do this thing and then they would you know have that kind of a finish. And it wasn't a long match, and it wasn't you know it was just basically it was basically Nia just destroying her until all the interference came. Well, then we had Randy Orton and Kevin Owens, which was supposed to be a match. But in fact, it was not a match because they begin brawling before the bell rings. And then Kevin goes to get the chair and the referee tries to stop him. So Kevin gives the referee a stunner. So they send all these officials down. Jamie Noble takes a bump in this melee. Orton then gets a chair. Sean Daivari tries to take the chair away. He gets bumped. Randy gives Kevin the draping DDT. Adam Pierce and Nick Aldis hit the ring to try and stop it. Randy gives Adam Pierce a stunner, so he's dead. And RKO. RKO, yeah. And then Randy and Kevin continue the brawl and they fight into the crowd. And man, they both looked really tired because they were just having a wild brawl. And then finally, Owen put him on a table, climbed up onto the seats, and leaped off with a flying elbow. They both go through the table. They're both dead and no match. So. Yeah. Well, the idea is like that Kevin was the one who laid him out with the elbow. But I mean, the big picture is is that for whatever reason, because again, with with Cody and and Kevin Owens being the direction, obviously Kevin should win. And you know the you know I mean it's Paul. You know Paul made the call, and I, for whatever reason, Paul wanted to do this without beating Randy. Wanted to protect Randy and. So we got this. And I think well, I think the reason he did that is because on the SmackDown show, they had a segment where Cody and Randy are in the locker room, and they're having some sort of discussion. And I forget what the discussion was, but but Cody says something, and and uh, and Randy says, you know, Cody says something like, I, I forget what it is, but but Randy turns and he he stares at the belt for a while. And then he makes a comment to Cody and walks off. And it was like absolutely, totally clear that Randy and Cody is coming up sooner rather than later. So I think it's probably going to be Kevin Owens and then Randy and then whatever they end up doing for WrestleMania. So I don't think they wanted to beat either of these guys with both of them going after Cody here in the next couple months. Yeah, yeah. We had L.A. Knight, Andrade, Carmelo for the U.S. title. And this was also a sprint. They had about seven minutes as well. And a lot of great three-way this really, spots. This, this, was, this was really well done. Yeah. You know, yeah, it was a really well done match. For the time they had, it was great. And the finish was like, well, first, yes, yeah, so they did the spot where uh, it's, it's Andrade and Carmelo fighting on the top rope. And L.A. Knight is going to try and run up the ropes. But he freaking runs up and he slips and he just totally crotches himself on the top rope. But because that's not the spot, he doesn't sell it at all. And goes up top and continues whatever he was going to do. And so they do a couple more three-way spots and everything. And then finally, Carmelo goes for his... It's like an Atlantida, but uh, it just ends up with like a slam. He doesn't go to the armbar or whatever. But he goes to do the, the big tilt-a-whirl thing. Mystica. Mystica. La Mystica. The, sorry, La Mystica. The Mystica, not the yeah. Atlantida. Yeah, yeah. So he goes for the La Mystica. And as he's spinning around in midair... L.A. flies in and hits the BFT out of midair. It looked awesome. And Andrade falls out of the way, and L.A. covers him and pins him. Great finish, and it was very good while it lasted. Yeah. Just, um, L.A. Knight destroyed these guys. He beat them both in singles matches. He beat them in every angle, for the most part. I think there's one that, that he didn't, but they lay them both out, you know, on the, the, the TV show the week before. And wins again. So it's kind of like um, he should be moving on from these guys. He should have moved on from these guys when he beat them both already. But there you go. So um, I don't know who's going to be next for him. But maybe they'll just keep it going. So then we had Cody and Gunther for the men's crown jewel title. And uh, this was also an excellent match. It was the best match on the show. And just a, a great pro wrestling WWE main event. I mean, Gunther kept going for the sleeper hold, which they've kind of gotten over as a finish now since he's beaten some guys with it. You know, Cody's going for all of his normal spots. He's getting chopped all to hell. 
And uh, near the finish, they start hitting their near falls. And Cody tries the cutter. Gunther catches him in the sleeper. Cody rolls backwards, cradles him, gets the pin. And they did point out this was that uh, Roddy Piper Bret Hart finish. And uh, and he gets the pin. So he wins the uh, the crown jewel title. And afterwards, they have a stare down. And Gunther offers a handshake. Cody gives it to him. Gunther tells him something and leaves. So there was no post-match attack or anything like that. It was just Gunther being a good sport about being beaten. And then they uh, give the crown jewel title to Cody. Hunter's out there. Liv Morgan's out there. Everybody celebrates as the show goes off the air. And, uh, yeah, they got it done in under three hours for this entire show, which was good. There was no, uh, this was not one of those shows with, like, 45 minutes of downtime between the semi-main and the main event. So that was very good. And uh, an excellent main event. Really liked it. I mean, yeah, I mean, I thought the main event was really good. But it was, um, I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing I would say negative about it. But I didn't think it was, like, outstanding. Like, when it was over, it was kind of like, this is really good. But it's like... You know, on an AEW show, every match is like this, and, and, and many better. It was just kind of like, okay, it was all right. I mean, the standards of main events on, on paper or, or, or big matches, I think the deal is the standards of big matches on pay-per-views right now is very, very high. I'm sure it's the highest it's ever been. And to me, this was like, um, you know, years back, if we had a pay-per-view with this main event, we'd go, this is really freaking good. But today, it's just kind of like... You know, we kind of expect matches like this. So I thought, you know, it was like, it was like nothing, it was well wrestled and it was nothing out of the ordinary. There was like nothing, like I think the thing with me was that what I'm watching is like, there's nothing creative about it. They're doing a regular match. It's very well done, but it never got, it never got to this level to me where it's like, oh my God, this is like so exciting. It was just kind of like, it was at this kind of level of it's really it's 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 very good like i you know so when the show was over it was kind of like uh you know i mean it's there's nothing negative about it but it was not it was not an outstanding show it was a very kind of like story storyline wise it was pretty much forgettable other than like i said the Sami Zayn thing which was um you know which was what it was what it it was it was it was that i thought was creative because of the super kick or the Haluva kick on Roman at the end, which I don't think people saw coming. And, um, you know, and the Roman pin, which for sure nobody saw coming. But, you know, so like, <laughs> excuse me, <clears throat> it was, um, yeah, it was kind of like, it was a show. It was certainly not a bad show, but it was, you know, when it comes to pay-per-views, um, even, you know, w even WWE pay-per-views, it was... I mean, I had some people say it was like the worst of the year, and I don't know it was the, the worst. The worst of the year. But, um... I guess there really aren't those uh, years where we have lots of bad pay-per-views. We haven't right? had a lot of bad pay-per-views this year. It was, um... You know, but it was like, as, as far as like, even though a lot of the W pay-per-views have been five-match shows, I think that um, this was on the low end, which is still good, because we've had, you know, W's had a very good year on pay-per-views, but I would say it was... You know, most of the pay-per-views, when they're over, I go, like, this is a pretty damn good show. And this one was kind of like, it was a show, and the matches were good. But if I had, if I had skipped the whole show, or if somebody, if, or if someone says, hey, hey, what do I need to watch on the show? I'd go, like, well, if you want to watch the, the post-match. And the main event's good, but, you know, you see matches like that. You see matches like that main event every week somewhere, you know, and many better. So it's kind of like you don't you don't have to watch. There's nothing where I tell you like, you got to watch this. I, there's almost pretty much nothing. So yeah, it was a show. So as noted on Raw Monday, we've got Sheamus, Seth Rollins, Dominic Mysterio, and Damian Priest fatal four way number one contenders match for the world title, and also Chad Gable versus Dragon Lee, which could be actually, very good. Could, that actually could be a really good match. Yes, they could have they could have a hell of a match. I'm surprised they're doing the four way. I just think that, like, um, I guess they just, I mean, I, I know that I was told um, they were that Priest was most likely to face Gunther at uh, the Saturday Night's Main Event show. Um, so I thought that when Dominic won, that they would do something with Dominic, maybe for a TV match, and then lead to the Priest match. But maybe, um, you know, we'll see. Because it's kind of like, if, um, if, like, Priest beats Dominic to win it and it's kind of like well he 
you know, won the thing back. It's kind of like, you know, why did you have Dominic? I mean, to me, if Dominic's going to beat Damian Priest, he really should be getting a championship match out of it, just because there's no other reason to beat Damian Priest other than that. So um, we'll see, you know, and, and we'll see. We'll see where they go. I, I suppose they could do Gunther and um, Dominic at uh, Science Main Event and hold Priest off to Royal Rumble also. You can always do that. Um, but I don't see Dominic winning both. I don't seem like winning last week and then winning this four way, but we'll see. All right, uh, New Japan Power Struggle on Monday morning. Zack Saber Jr. Shingo Takagi for the IWGP World Heavyweight Title is the main event. And it's also, um, it's also uh, like it's it's re- it is technically Monday morning in Japan, but. Um, it's, well, it's Monday afternoon in Japan. In the United States, it's it's Saturday night. It starts at, um, I think it's starting at um, either 9 o'clock or 9.30 our time. Um, it's so it's already Saturday. started? Today's Saturday. Oh, tomorrow night, I'm sorry. Sunday tomorrow night, night. yes. Sun, it's uh, Sunday night, yeah. Sunday night our time. Um, and like uh, 12.30 or 1. I think that they have a pre-show match that's going to be, like it's, I think it's 9.30 uh, for, the, for the first match. Um, on the show, yeah, is is when it's starting. All right, so we got uh, Zach and Shingo Takagi for the IWGP World Title. We've got David Finley versus Tai Chi for the Global Championship. Doki versus Master Watto for the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Title. In the Super Junior Tag League Finals, it will be Robbie Eagles and Kosei Fujita versus TJP and Francesco Akira. That is the finals of the tournament. Kenny Omega will be making his appearance. First appearance in a long time. We have got TMDK versus Hanare and Great Khan for the IWGP Tag Team Titles. Yes, so, Mikey, no- Nichols and, uh, Mikey Nichols and Shane Hayes, two are the yes. champions. Yes. Sonata versus Shota Umino. We've got Tanahashi and Oleg Bolton versus Evil and Ren Narita. Dragon, Dia, Ryusuke, Taguchi, Honma, and Toru Yano. Versus Bushi, Hiromo, Hiromu, Yodosuji, and Naito. And then we've got Taiji Shimori, Gabe Kidd, Robbie X, and Drilla Maloney, and Clark Connors. Versus Kushida, Kevin Knight, Jude London, Paris De Silva, and Katsuya Murashima. That's the full lineup for no, Power no, there's, Struggle. There's, 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 there's also uh, Shomakato and Kapitan Suicida and Tiger Mask. Yes, the and dark, the uh, kick Ninja Mac. Mesh. The DKC and Yo. Yes. So that's 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 the opener. So um, yeah, they. Um, I mean, this tour has been about the um, the Super Juniors. They had um, the match with um, what was it? It was uh, Kosei Fujita and Robbie Eagles against Drilla Maloney and Clark Connors. This would have been on the twenty seventh, and this was one of the best tag team matches of the year. I mean, this match was it was every bit as good as that Young Bucks Private Party match. Um, and almost as good as the Young Bucks match with um, um, Will Ospreay and uh, and uh, Kyle Fletcher. I mean, it's just an awesome, awesome match. Um, these teams are these teams are great, and um, I'm just glad to see that uh, you know that Eagles and Fujita is is someone to really watch. He's just he's got something that you know you just um, he's got a great presence, and he's technically an excellent wrestler. And um, Rob Eagles is super, super underrated. So anyway, the <clears throat> so that the in the <clears throat> in the A Block Finals, um, it ended up with um, Eagles and Fujita won. Um, they were they were four and one, and then Clark Connors and uh, Maloney, um, need, if they had won the, the, the final match over Bushi and Hermu Takashi, they would have gone to the finals because uh, they had beaten. Uh, Fujita and um, Eagles in that match on the 27th, but they lost, so um, it ends up with uh, Fujita going. So then in the um, the B block, Ghetto booked everybody to be two and two going into the last night. So there are going to be three guys tied, and then it would just depend on. So everybody was el- everybody was still, um, you know, no matter what, everybody was still had a chance to win. So it ended up with um, um, Taichi Shimori and Robbie X beat the Velocities. Um, the Velocities, so, so Paris De Silva is um, really small, and he is really, really good. And the Velocities, like, 
they're just like this small team that um, just moves really fast and all action and just a lot of fun to watch. And uh, they had a nice match. You know, not anything spectacular or anything, but, um, you know, just big, really quick movement. And Robbie X is very, very good. Taiji Ishimori, obviously, really, really good as well. Then um, TJP and Akira, you know, Francisco Akira, excellent tag team. Um, they um, beat the DKC and Ninja Mac. And this match, Ninja Mac did some pretty cool stuff in this match. Um, and um, but, but they won, as expected. And then you had... Um, Kevin Knight and Kushida beat Yo and Rocky Romero. So if Rocky Romero and Yo had won, I believe that they would have. I think that I think actually it might have been a three way, um, because I think all those three teams would have been one and one against each other. So that means that they would have had to do a three way match to determine who would, you know, and add that to the card who would determine to face the A block winner. But Kevin Knight and Kushida won. So the way it turned out, um, you know, TJP and Akira. Um, ended up having wins over both of those teams, so um, they went to the finals. So that's what happened there. All right, uh, Bill Goldberg was on ESPN and said the news of the day is in 2025, Goldberg is having his retirement match. Said, I think we know who the subject or the victim probably, the front runner right now, we know who it is in 2025. It's, 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 almost, it's almost certainly going to be Gunther. Well, that would be, uh, they've been teasing that one. Yeah. Uh, Triple H said, I can tell you when Bill comes back, when, Kim, when Bill came back, he was not too happy with Gunther. So, yes, that's that's the tease. Well, that's going to be it. You know, he says they, already he the, they already did, when they did the angle, you knew they were going to have a match. It was a question of when, so I don't know if it's going to be, um. I think it's going to be. I, mean, I don't know. I'll, he I'll said no out. date, no time. He's got a few months to get ready. Yeah, may not be. I mean, you'd think it's mania. I guess I can check on it. I know when they shot the angle. I was told it wasn't going to be at mania, but those things, you know, for that many months in advance, you know, they may not have even had it locked down at the time of like when they're going to do it because it's going to be like, like it's going to be when when Bill won. I, I think they'll want in a big match. So I could see it being at Mania, but they may have other plans for Gunther at Mania. I don't know. All right. Uh, we've also got, oh, we had WWE cuts. Did you talk about these on Friday? A little bit. So, I mean, the, the basic gist is that, you know, I mean, every, I think everyone knows that the story is that um, Tegan Knox and Indy Hartwell were cut. And Corbin, um, Corbin had signed an extension of his contract and it was running out, and so it ran out, and so he is gone. So Corbin can go anywhere he wants right now, and the other ones have 90-day non-competes. And, I mean, as far as, like, you know, I I mean, what happened and why is pretty much, I think everyone's, there's no insidious stories or anything like this. I mean, pretty much what you would think. Tegan Knox, I think they just felt, um, I mean, she didn't stand out when she came back. Um, and they just basically injury, you know, she had a lot of injury issues and they stopped using her. And, um, she, when she, like I said, when she came back, they gave her, they gave, they, they tried to give her a push. It didn't really take, and they just stopped using her. Uh, Corbin on the main roster, you know, I mean, Corbin did well in NXT. They brought him back to the main roster and then essentially they just didn't do anything with him. And I guess the decision was made that they're not going to do anything with him, and so uh, why resign him? And it'll be interesting to see, like, like Tegan Knox, she's going to go, she's going to wrestle. You know, she wrestled before WWE. You know, wherever it is, um, whether she gets signed by, I mean, sir, I, w- I would, I would think if she's not signed by AEW, and I don't know that there's any reason for AEW to sign her, but they might. Um, that she'd probably wind up with TNA because every ex WWE person that doesn't go to AEW ends up in TNA, um, and the same with Indy Hartwell um, if she wants to go. And again, she wrestled for years and years and years before this, so I would see. You know, I, I presume that she will wrestle. I mean, um, you know, Knox has already said she's wrestling. She, you know, she's not going to give this up. Um, Corbin kind of wrote like. You know, like, I don't know that, that he's necessarily going to wrestle again. Um, it was not like, I mean, he was a guy recruited by WWE 
only did WWE. Um, you know, I mean, I would, I would suspect if AEW wanted him, he would go there because there's money there. But I don't know that he would be someone who you're going to start seeing on indies on a regular basis like some people, like the, the other two. So um, I don't know what will happen with him. You know, I mean, it just depends. But, you know, he was basically, it was 12 years. You know, he'd worked for them for a long time. And, and you know, he was a football player. You know, he got more out of this than he expected to, you know. If he went to the NFL, I doubt he thought he'd last 12 seasons. So he got more than he expected, made money. Um, and uh, we'll see what he does. WrestleMania 3. Yeah, so... Keith Elliott Greenberg is writing a book about WrestleMania three, um, and he just did an article in um, um, one of the magazines in the UK, and so he had this is the story on the WrestleMania attendance, and uh, you know he, he wrote so he talked to Basil Devito, and Basil Devito is the one who came up with the ninety three thousand number, and of course Basil Devito said it was legit. Um, he said, like, I will go to my grave saying that that is the real number. But he did say we included everybody in the building. We included ticket takers and the people who work backstage and the people, the, you know, um, the people doing concessions and the people in the food booth and the people running the buildings and all this. I mean, that's kind of like what you say when you fake a number. And, I mean, we've already seen... Uh, WWE like letters to you. the the real the real telling one was um the Royal Rumble at uh, in San Antonio was you know very telling you know because WWE basically trying to get the building and go like well include this and include this I mean they were including the people who are outside the building the police who are outside the building doing security not even people in the building as attendants they were including the people who worked in the car parking lot as attendants you know. Um, this is this is in the San Antonio um, Royal Rumble, so you know whatever. So so, um, but I mean like both um, Ed Cohen and Zane Bresloff had both told me that that he made up a number. They had to have a number that was going to be bigger than anything else because Vince had decreed they were going to announce the largest indoor crowd in history. That was it. That was what was going to be announced, so we have to announce a number more than anyone else is going to do, particularly like the Pope. And then the Silver Dome, of course, later, um, because of the WrestleMania number, they gave a fake number for the Pope, which was bigger than the WrestleMania number. You know, so that's, you know, whatever, because they, they decided for whatever reason that, that they were going to have their all-time record be by the Pope and not by professional wrestling. Um, but there was something else there that I thought was interesting, um, and it may explain something if this story is true. And, and if the story, uh, Tom Buchanan was one of the people who worked there for WWE. He said that at the show, that he said he wasn't, didn't remember if it was Basil DeVito or Linda McMahon, but they made the rule that once the show started, they were going to open up the doors and basically tell people, you know, if they're anywhere near, you can come into the show for free. So they just piled people in to make sure every seat was full because they didn't want any seat full, seats not full. And if you look at in the early matches, the upper deck did have a couple thousand seats that were empty, um, and they may have been full by the end because they just said that they just let all these kind of all these people in. Um, I don't know that this is true. I never heard this before, but. And, it, and why I'm saying that it, it may not be is because um, they absolutely did this at WrestleMania Five in Toronto. I remember that day, like again, like in, in Toronto. WrestleMania I'm Six. Told, what six? The one with Hogan and Warrior. Yes, that was six. 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 I mean, I was told that exact story, so it could be him confusing the Toronto show with the Pontiac show, or they could have done it both. You know, I just never heard that and. It was weird because, you know, it's 37 years, and you would think that that story would have come out. Um, but, I mean, it could be, which would explain why the, you know, the ticket number, you know, which the, 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 the combination of tickets sold and comps was 78,000, and maybe there were, you know, 80,000, 82,000 people in the building. 
um, it's possible. Um, you know, I mean, that, that would explain some of that. Um, I mean, obviously, there was not 93,000. That's just a made-up number. But um, that might explain why, you know, it's, it's 78,000 tickets and 75,000 paid and, you know, whatever. Now, you know, again, when you're announcing attendance, um, it is – some sports will just do paid, which is probably the fairest way to do it is just the paid. Um, because if you're announcing paid in comps, a lot of the comps don't even come, so you're announcing a fake number when you're doing that. But that's been done um, – you know that's been done in plenty of places too, which is tickets out, which which in this case would have been like seventy eight thousand, a little over, just over seventy eight thousand. So um, anyway, that was that was Basil's explanation and 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 Tom Buchanan's explanation as far as how there were so many people or whatever, you know, that that they just let everybody in for free, um, you know, once the show started because they just because Vince made it very clear that that they needed to have it look full. So, there you go. All right, uh, Harry Smith. Yeah, he's going for, um, on Monday, he's going for the Triple Crown against Yuma Ayoyagi. So, um, biggest match of his career. And um, so, yeah, yeah, he, that, was a, that was a deal where he did the um, David Wish Smith Jr. A couple weeks ago, he said that no member of his family, you know, and he mentioned... Um, Johnny Smith, who did work for All Japan, but I don't think was ever near that Triple Crown level, and uh, Dynamite, who, um, you know, I don't remember Dynamite could ever challenge him for the Triple Crown because they used to pretty much make him as a junior heavyweight. And Davey, you know, I don't remember him ever challenging, you know, his father for the Triple Crown. So he was going to be the first one to challenge for the Triple Crown. So he did that promo and everything like that. So uh, anyway, it's the biggest match of his career coming up this week. Uh, Monday, actually. Angel Garza's got a broken wrist, I guess. Underwent wrist surgery. Yeah, he um, he landed on it and heard it pop. I don't know if it was a break. There was some medical term. Um, and basically, they couldn't fix it without surgery, so he had surgery, yeah. And what's the update on Samoa Joe? He should be back soon because the TV show that he was doing um, just finished filming this week. So, yeah, he should be, um, whenever they need him back, I mean, he's, uh, he's eligible to be back now. All right, uh, before we get to Collision, the Hall of Fame. Yeah, so um, I have not, I do not look at votes until the 8th, November the 8th. So I do not know, but there are people who send in their votes to the Hall of Fame tracker. And... Um, I guess when I looked at the, um, I actually looked at like, like, you know, whatever it was, the people who voted, and so, um, or the the tracking of the votes, and um, so based on this, and and a lot of times this has not been consistent with, with the the votes end up being, but um, I guess the one thing that, um, so the ones who are the highest vote getters, that in theory based on the votes that they have, would have 60% and be in. would be Bobby Davis, who, you know, has come close before and, and should be in. JYD, which has never really come close before. Um, Paul Orndorff, who was very close last year and, and would not have been a surprise to get in. Uh, Shingo Takagi, who um, probably should be in. I think that, like, the big thing is if, if Tomohiro Ishii is in, Shingo Takagi has to be in because they're both similar-level wrestlers. But Shingo Takagi, I mean, the, the knock on Ishii was always that, um, you know, he wasn't a top guy. He wasn't a, 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 you know, IWGP champion. He was never champion many times, but he's never IWGP champion. Never headlined the Tokyo Dome. Never really headlined, really didn't headline big shows. He was on big shows and had great matches. He had, I think he may have, he headlined some G1 nights that he, you know, was really big, but like never in the G1 finals, let alone G1 champion, never a block winner um, or anything like that. Just a guy who would, you know, be in the G1 and, you know, win half and lose half and have freaking incredible matches every night. I mean, you know, he, 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 many years he was the, one of the best, if not the best guy in the G1, but the feeling is that Shingo Takagi is just as good and he is absolutely on the same level. And, um, you know, Shingo Takaki was IWGP champion and was 
the um, Open the Dreamgate champion and was junior champion and super juniors, you know, finals and, you know, things like that. I mean, he's, he's from, from that standpoint, he's far ahead of Ishii. So, um, you know, that was that. And then the Young Bucks, um, and then um, the other ones, um, Moore Siegel, um, Houston promoter, and the Von Erichs. And I figured that that movie would help the Von Erichs. I mean, um, it makes, I mean, I cannot in any way, shape, or form, like, um, I mean, it's, it's hard with JYD, and Kerry Von Erich was a bigger national star than JYD until JYD went to WWF, and there's nothing that JYD did in WWF that would make me think he's a Hall of Famer. I mean, it would all be based on, you know, the four years that he was on top in Mid-South Wrestling. And, um, you know, in that period, Kerry was a bigger national star. And I saw, you know, um, I saw Kerry Von Erich in Mid-South live. I saw Junkyard Dog in Dallas live in, in each other's territory. And Kerry Von Erich in Mid-South was way more over than Junkyard Dog in Dallas, so to speak. But, you know, I don't, that's not necessarily a reason. But they were both... They were both very big for a short period of time in, in, in regions. And if they had had a longer run in those regions, like a, it wouldn't have to be a Jerry Lawler length run, you know, which was a long run. But even if it was like a, a Ray Stevens in San Francisco length run, they'd probably both be in, but they didn't. You know, they both drug problems, Kerry got hurt, things like that. You know, they, they um, you know, Kerry was on top, but that territory was dead for much of the period he was on top. Uh, JYD was on top, you know, and, and the, the territory had some high spots and, and did well overall. It was probably, you know, it wasn't the best period in the history of the company. I mean, the best period actually came right after he left with, um, you know, the Rock and Roll Express and Midnight Express and Duggan and everything. Um, but he was involved in the, the biggest couple-week period, which was the Bill Watson Stagger Lee against the Midnight Express feud, and um, and but he was you know in that feud it was really Bill Watts and Jim Cornette who made that feud. I mean, you know the Midnight Express were Jim Cornette's guys, and they were great because they could have a match with Bill Watts and, and JYD and actually have it be a super match um, to an extent. I mean, the match they had in New Orleans was was really good because Bobby and Dennis were that good. The match I saw in Oklahoma City, you know, which was um, which set the record in that city. I mean, you know, JYD um, barely worked the match. Bill worked almost the entire match. JYD was like, like whatever it was. And Bill had a torn hamstring, so he's working this match with a torn hamstring. He can't move. Bobby is just selling like crazy. But it was kind of a to me. It, it was you know the people were with it. Um, because in those days they're going to be with it with Bill Watson, his promos and everything. But it really wasn't like, in some ways I thought the match was really sad because just Bill, just unable to move, throwing these like bad looking punches and Bobby Eaton just flying all over the place. Um, but whatever, you know, but then that, that would have been the territory peak. You know, Bill got hurt in the first match and then went to every other match because it was a big feud and everything, but he was very limited in what he could do. But anyway, the, the point, I guess, um, um, is is um, it's just hard to, for me, and so anyway, Roman Reigns was at 33%, and I cannot in any way, shape, or form understand why Roman Reigns would be below these guys. I mean, this guy... Biggest, you know, biggest star in the biggest company for years and years and years. And the knock before, a couple of years back, was, well, business was going down. And it's like, you know what? I mean, do you know how much business went down with the frickin' Von Erichs on top in Dallas after the peak? You know, went down every year. It was terrible at the end. You know, I mean, um, I mean, they had their peak run. Um, but I guess you could say they had their peak run. But, okay, now we're in probably the second or third biggest boom period. And you could even argue the first biggest, because from a financial standpoint, obviously there's never been a period where they made more money. I think the Austin period with The Rock was really bigger you know, than this one. The Hogan period, I think, with, because of Hogan, you could argue it. 
but there's a lot of metrics where you could say that this one's bigger, certainly merchandise wise, you know, um, and everything. So you got a guy who's always near the top as far as merchandise sales, the guy who is pushes the top guy, who set all, so many record gates, you know, all over the country, all over the world, you know. And it's like, yes, it's the brand, of course, but he's the top guy in the brand during a boom period. You know what I mean? That's, that's where it changed in the last two years. It was a freaking boom period, and he was the guy. He had a lengthy run as world champion um, that was successful. Um, headlined, you know, the big, you know, the biggest WrestleManias ever. You know, I mean, that last WrestleMania was the biggest ever, on any, by any metric. Um, and so, I mean, I don't know. I just thought like, uh, there's, you know, is WWE judged differently? Is is you know, I don't know. I mean, it's like it's like it just. Uh, I I cannot. I mean, I can't fathom these guys being ahead of Roman Reigns. And I know that you don't vote for them in the same category. And Roman Reigns is in a far far tougher category with you know, Young Bucks and Orndorff and and all those guys. I mean, they're all pretty much stronger than the guys in the um, the other category. But um, I don't know. I mean, things like that happen. I mean, it, you know, I knew the movie would make a big difference. Um, but it certainly doesn't change anything. I mean, if you really think about, like, the Von Erichs, I mean, their story was done in 1990, you know, all of a sudden in 2024, um, all of a sudden they shoot up because of the movie. It's um, kind of, I mean, it's interesting. I wasn't surprised, you know, and I, I expect Oli to shoot up too, you know, and, um, I mean, Oli has a stronger case than they do. Oli at least has a lot of longevity on top. Um I mean, as a peak singular draw, was he ever as big as Kerry? No. No, not even close. As big as JYD? No, not even close. But he had years and years and years and years and years of big draw in territory. And he was a booker. Um, at times a successful booker, at times not a successful booker. You know, he was part of the Minnesota Wrecking Crew and the Four Horsemen, who were the catalyst group for, um, you know, all of these factions and everything. The Four Horsemen were, like, they weren't the first. You know, I mean, there were other groups before them. But they were the ones that everyone remembers on a national basis as the first that led to the the DXs and the outsider, you know, NWOs and all of those things. So there's, you know, even as much as Ole himself hated his role in the Four Horsemen and hated the Four Horsemen period and everything, he still was part of it. And he was, you know, again, one of the, Ole was one of the great promos guys of all time. He was a great, great heel. He's a, you know, like, he's a borderline guy. Like, when, when all those periods where people would go, like, why isn't he in, people have grudges. And it's like, if you look at the record, it's like he's a borderline guy. If he gets in good, if he doesn't get in, it's not like all these people have grudges against him, so that's why he's not in. It's like, you know, he, he could get in, he could not get in. Either way is fine. Um, I, but I, I think, I guess the thing is, is with Roman Reigns is that, like, he is so far past these these guys. I thought he... I think, you know, like, there's people who said, well, Bobby Davis is the strongest guy in the ballot. No fucking way. Roman Re Bobby Davis was the manager of Buddy Rogers, who was, was a big, big draw. And Bobby Davis absolutely should be in the Hall of Fame. And I hope he gets in. He, he should have got in last year or the year before. Um, and people have talked about it. And, and, you know, I mean, he's got a very good shot, one of the best shots. But still, of all, this, of all the guys on the ballot, um, they're in one you know, I mean, that I would say is a stronger candidate than Roman Reigns. Just too many years as the top guy, setting records, um, drawing TV, drawing merch. Um, you know, the the company's gotten so big in the last couple of years. And yeah, Sami Zayn was the reason to kickstart the real big period working with Roman. But Roman was the other guy. But then Roman continued, and the Cody Rhodes thing ended up really, really big, and the title reign ended up really, really big. And yes, they put him in the position for years, and and it did take a couple of years for him to really get over as the top guy. He was given chances that other people weren't, but that goes for many, many people historically, and many of them didn't succeed, and some of them are still in the Hall of Fame just because they were given belts for for a long period of time during periods that weren't necessarily even great. So, um, yeah, I just, um, 
I just do not, you know, I, I looked at that, and it's like he was 31st among however many candidates. I'm going, 31st? He's he's the best guy on the entire ballot. Um, you know, I mean, um, I mean, as far as, like, overall, I mean, I guess, you know, if you want to say Shingo Takagi's better because he was a world champion, he's a way better wrestler, he's had way better matches. Yeah, I agree. I agree, like, in the sense of when it comes to having the best matches, is he going to be, um, does his work rate all, you know, just work rate alone, if you take out all the other categories, does he get in on work rate alone? No, of course not. Does he get in based on drawing? Absolutely he should. Does he get in based on being, you know, top guy for his era, which oh, every top guy of the era always gets in. And he'll get in someday, too. You know, I mean, it may be a sting thing where, you know, 20 years later people will go like, why isn't he in? These voters were stupid then or whatever. And he's got better credentials than Sting ever had when it comes to this. Um, you know, I mean, much bigger draw than Sting ever was, not even close. Um I, you know, you could argue as far as wrestler goes. Um, you know, I mean, they're both they're both at the same level wrestlers. Maybe Sting might, you know, I think Sting at his best, maybe even better. But, um, but I mean, you know, again, like Sting was a top guy during a lot of bad periods, and um, during one good period as well. Roman was the top guy during a much, much, much bigger period, so, or at least much more successful period. Well, we'll see what happens when these ballots come in. I'm voting for them. I'll just throw that out there. Yeah. All right, uh, we got to talk about Collision here, the uh, show. Did you watch this whole show? You know what happened? I, I'm going to have to start checking this. My, my oh, DVR. let me guess. Your DVR cut off at the end? No, my DVR didn't work. Oh it didn't wow. pick up. That's even so worse. I ended up I ended up getting home and I did watch I I got home and I did watch the last hour of the show. And I was pissed because I was out and I'm getting all these texts about Kyle Fletcher and Commander is this incredible match. Oh I mean like I got so many texts from people about Kyle Fletcher and Commander and I was I can't wait to go home and watch Kyle Fletcher and Commander and it didn't freaking pick up. So I watched I watched from the John Moxley promo and the second part, and I, I've had all these, you know, I've, I had people tell me, what a great show. It's like, I saw the second hour. I didn't think it was that great. It was just like a show. But apparently, Kyle Fletcher and Commander had an incredible match, and I missed the first hour. And mm. I'm sure I will find, I tried freaking torrent spots, couldn't find anything to watch that, that first hour. But I'm sure that by tomorrow morning, I will watch that first hour. So I was, right now, not in the best of moods, because... I, I'm a big fan of Kyle Fletcher, and um, I think Commander's awesome. And I know some people have been going like, he's so great that, you know, because he gets the people into his matches, even though he always loses. And it's, God damn, he shouldn't always lose. This guy's way too good. He's just, and, and they put him in this situation where, um, you know, it's like, yeah, he'll go in there and give you a great match, and he almost always does. But he doesn't draw ratings because you always beat him, and people just see him as the average. He's he's won he's job. won two matches in all two singles matches in all of twenty twenty four two. And uh, if I if I had one criticism actually of that match, and I'll, I'll let me put it this he's way, won two, won two, won two, I mean he won two in the last week. I mean, well, because he he no, won, he won he, one in the last week. He won he he won he won in San Jose because I saw it live, and then he won over Leo Rush on Friday night. Or on, on the or Wednesday. What was so the San Jose match? Um, God, I'm trying to remember the match. The, it was the match that set him up for the Brian Cage match. Um, so he won the match and then he lost to Brian Cage in Stockton. So um, I forgot. I, I forgot who he won over, but it was he definitely won a singles match in San Jose. Mm. Well, anyway, I'll get to that match in a minute because I'll be. Uh, listen, I'll get to it when I get to it. So, uh, open up with Tony Schiavone in the ring with uh, Private Party and a bunch of other tag teams, and they did a promo. It was good because they put over like Private Party winning the tag titles is like a significant thing by opening the show with it and having all the other teams out there. And they basically said they'd uh, defend the titles against anybody. And so they're going to be having a contenders series which is going to be leading to a match, a multi-team match coming up at Full Gear. First match is coming up next week. 
Yes, yeah, it's, it's a four team. Do you have the matches? We probably should go through the matches. I know Outrunners. I thought when I looked at it, I thought it was going to be Outrunners and FTR, and um, I forgot the other team that I thought they might be. It might be. It's LFI is wrestling. Who, who are they wrestling? I will. Uh, I'll find it here. I had it somewhere. All right, uh, we've got I, I, the out- okay. I, I, wait, I got it. It's Outrunners versus Top Flight, FTR yeah, versus FTR. House of Black. La Faction yeah, that, that, versus- one, that one. That one. That one can go either way, but I think FTR should win. But yeah, I, 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 I could. I could see it going either way. And then the La Faction versus the Acclaim. The winners will face Private Party in a four-way. Yeah, I could see that last one going either way, but I. I, I don't know. I just think if it's going to be Rush and Mortos. I would hope that they would win. Uh, even Drillistico, the Rush and Drillistico. The, but the thing is, is you know, like. They have Drillistico who can always do the job, but Rush and Drillistico, with that match with FTR, that match was freaking great last week. So then we had uh, an interview with the Acclaimed, and the story is that as Max is doing his promo, Anthony notices that he still has MVP's business card. And mm-hmm. Max tries to blow it off, but there's definitely tension after that discovery. Mm-hmm. We had Harley Cameron, Thunder Rosa, in a Dia de los Muertos match, which... You know, they did the uh, hardcore match. They had the uh, stuff outside. There were some tables. Um, it was it was fine. The finish was actually really good because they did something that was extremely risky. Not in like a dangerous way, but they basically... Thunder took a table and she folded the legs of the table down on one side so that it was like a ramp. And then she put Harley in the corner with a trash can on her head. And she was going to run up the ramp and jump off it to do a drop kick into the can into uh, Harley. And I was like, man, this table could have collapsed so easily. And somehow she pulled it off, and so it made the finish great. But someone is going to try that who weighs a little bit more, and it ain't going to work at all. But that was the finish of this match. So Thunder Rosa won. We had Kyle Fletcher and Commander. This is what I'm going to say about this match. So I can make everybody mad. So first off, in a vacuum, this match was freaking awesome. Absolutely, completely fantastic. Okay? However, the whole idea here is like, we're trying to do something with Kyle Fletcher, right? By the time this match was over, it was like, are we pushing Commander? Like, they... maybe, Maybe they should push Commander. Dude, this match is like, this match was going absolutely great. And then they do this spot near the end where Commander does this big moonsault. And you know how the guy does the moonsault and the other guy gets the knees up? Or sometimes yep. the guy goes for the moonsault and the guy just puts his feet up and the guy hits the feet? Commander goes for this moon this moonsault and Kyle Fletcher, like, he kicks him. Like, he's doing a leg press. So the guy goes for the moonsault and he kicks him as he's coming down and he shoots him even higher into the air. The place goes nuts for this spot. And then he grabs the guy and he does this giant... Like last ride sit out power bomb, and it's like one, two, and commander kicked out, and I was like, what? Why are you kicking out? And then commander does this huge comeback, and he's doing big move on Kyle Fletcher, big move on Kyle Fletcher, big move on Kyle Fletcher. He does the rope walk, double springboard, boom to the outside on Kyle Fletcher. I'm like, okay, is this the beginning of the commander push? Like, I just couldn't believe this. So he hits all these giant moves, and he's just killing this dude. And then finally, Kyle crotches him on his springboard, hits the corner kick in the brain buster and pins him. And, like, it was an awesome match, but we're trying to get Kyle Fletcher over here. You know what I'm saying? And even the announcers, even the announcers said, this was not the showcase match that Kyle Fletcher wanted. And I was like, you're right, it wasn't. I want a showcase match for Kyle Fletcher. Like, let's separate these two guys and, like, Let's push Commander and have him beat somebody, and let's have Kyle Fletcher kill somebody. That's what I thought when this match was over. But if you want a match in a vacuum that's like one of the best TV matches you're going to see all year, this was it. Well, I would say you don't look to get fortune in the mouth, and maybe you use this to start pushing Commander. Kyle Fletcher's going to get pushed either way. I mean, he's look, Kyle Fletcher's going to wrestle Will Ospreay on the pay-per-view. So and and Yeah, so he shouldn't have gone 50-50 with Commander. Well, what if the I well if it if, if it leads Dave, to commander, if this leads to a commander push if it leads to commander you're right. getting over then you know what it's not going to 
Well, you're right? probably right. Okay. You're probably, you're probably right. You're probably right. Okay. But maybe it'll wake people up. I mean, that's what happens in matches like this. Sometimes, Dave, if you, you haven't have been wake, match. if you haven't been woken up to Commander by now, what are we talking yeah. about here? I know. I know. I mean, it's not like I watched this match and realized he was great. It's like it's been well known for a long time. Yeah, I know. I know. Um that yeah, I mean, um and and I don't see the funny part is is like I don't see the role for him to be pushed. It's just not um you know, I mean, his his role it seems to always be have a really good match with a guy and lose. Yes. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that except, you know, when it comes to um I mean, people still see it as a enhancement match, and that's the problem because he doesn't have a lot of wins. Um and if they give him a bunch of wins, it's still people are still gonna say, Well, you know, he's not he, he you know, unless he beats somebody like really big and he ain't gonna beat somebody really big. He could, you know, and they could go somewhere with him. But I don't know that they will. I mean, they already got Bandito sitting there, you know, who's got more upward mobility, you know, and, and maybe more charisma, although Commander does have some charisma. I mean, that's the one thing. And, I mean, like in the spot that Hologram was supposed to have that still and he, and he still has, Commander would have been better than Arama, or Aramis in that spot, no doubt about it. Um, but, you know, Commander had been, you know, he'd been – around too long and the other guys knew and and i mean and he did well you know and before he got hurt but um i don't know it's uh i i hope that i hope that it springboards him into something but it is likely that that won't happen um cuz you can only push so many guys at one time but i mean the one thing that they did do is is uh i think it's pretty clear that at some point um Takeshita and uh Kyle Fletcher are going to be getting a tag title match with Private Party and uh, and they're doing they're doing something this week on Wednesday it's going to be Takeshita and uh Kyle Fletcher against Ricochet and a mystery partner on Wednesday night and that match could be like freaking incredible depending on who the partner is maybe the partner will be commander and he'll lose then he'll lose the fall mm. and have another, yes. sp- another spe- spectacular match and if they do that it actually makes sense you know, because at least it built to another match. So um, I don't know if that's what it's going to be. And maybe, I mean, I don't think that that's, you know, I think they probably have an idea. They already knew where they were going with it. It'll be interesting to see who that, that partner is. Um, I suppose it could be Will Ospreay. Jesus Christ, would that match be great? But if it was going to be that match. Dude, if it's Will Ospreay and they don't advertise him, I mean, come on. Uh, I know, I know. That would be, not advertising that would be incredibly silly but it is a position you know um where you got a guy who can um i mean you i my gut is in this match that the partner of will os a uh, partner of rick Shea is a guy who's going to be the one to do, to do the job in the match but also a guy who's really good and they have a whole bunch of people who can fit that role uh, there's endless supply of people who are really good who can be ricochet's tag team partner and and, and give you a hell of a match in that tag match and get to catch it and and um um, um, Kyle Fletcher over. Could be Mark Davis. We had a uh, Jack Perry it's, it's promo. A little, it's, a little too, it's a little too early. For yes, Mark it will Davis, not so. be him. We had a uh, Jack Perry promo, and he's interrupted by Daniel Garcia, and they go back and forth, and Jack basically tells him, you are not ready. So they're obviously going to be going up against each other for the uh, TNT title. Yeah, yeah, that's probably in the pay-per-view. Archer and Cage killed Sean Smith and Joe Keyes. And then, it's funny... It's these two giant guys who are supposed to be heels, and they kill these two jobbers, and they continue killing them afterwards. And they're killing them in such a spectacular manner that Roderick Strong and the Kingdom, who are supposed to be babyfaces, hit the ring to run them off, and they get booed because the fans wanted to see Archer and Cage kill these guys more. Kyle's shown watching on, and they're leading to something there. So, so, so we've got this. We've got six teams in this elimination for the tag team title tournament, and um, I mean I can see why uh, Fletcher and Takeshita aren't in it because they're going to be wrestling on the pay per view in singles matches. But Cage and uh, Archer, you would think that they should be in it. 
clearly don't want to beat him yet. More, more, more than top flight, you know. Yes. Air Fox is doing a promo, and the patriarchy shows up, and Christian cuts a promo on him. He says, I have never forgotten you attacking me in my wrestling school last year, but I'm a man now. I've changed. Did you see what we did to Hook? He's supposed to face Christian Wednesday. I don't think he's going to show up. And Fox says, I don't know anything about any of that, but I will see you next week on Collision, and don't sleep on Hook. So it is uh, Nick Wayne and A.R. Fox Collision next week. They should have a really good match. Yeah. Mm. Statlander did a promo challenging uh, Mercedes for full gear. So that'll be yeah, a TBS we, title match. Yeah, we knew that one was coming. That's been, that's been um, you know, obvious for a long time. So then Moxie comes out with his crew and he starts cutting a promo. Talks about Philadelphia, the home of Orange Cassidy. But also he says the home of this young man, Wheeler Yuta. Is this kid, he understands sacrifice and putting your ego aside. He'll fight for something bigger than himself. And, of course, out comes Action Andretti, who apparently is also from Philadelphia, but he had to read between the lines. He, is. And he, is. he got he, he got booed trying to play local babyface, though. Because I don't think people knew he was from local. Like, they booed him, and he had, a, he had tried to explain that he was from the area. Like, no, they should have made it he, clear at the beginning. It, no, right away they didn't know. But even when he explained he's from Philadelphia and we're do this blah 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 in Philadelphia and everything, they still booed him. Which you know, again, Action Andretti is the kind of a babyface who's going to get booed in Philadelphia. Well, he's kind of turning heel, also. Yeah, but he, even as a babyface, he'd have gotten booed in Philadelphia. So he said he would face any member of this new crew, and he gets jumped from behind by Pac, and uh, Pac kills him for a long time. And uh, ends up with a short comeback by action, but then he gets killed. Put in the Brutalizer, submitted. Pac refuses to release the hold, so out comes Orange Cassidy. And Orange gets the mic and he says, I love Philly, just like Wheeler does. And he says, Wheeler, do you remember when you started training? You stayed at my, at my house, you hung out with my best friend Chuck Taylor. He said, we like that Wheeler, but I don't like this Wheeler. This Wheeler, he thinks John Moxley cares about him, but John doesn't. He's using you. And I'm going to show everybody that John isn't the man he says he is. So, of course, Moxley starts yelling at Wheeler. He goes, go get this guy. And Wheeler's not going. So Moxley slaps him around, tells him to go get him. So Wheeler goes after Orange Cassie, but Orange just puts his hands in his pockets. And Wheeler doesn't know what to do. And so he grabs a chair, and Orange still has his hands in his pockets. So he looks back at Moxley, and Orange grabs a chair. And then a brawl starts, and, Mo and uh, Orange lays him out with the orange punch. Moxley and the crew go after Orange, but he escapes through the crowd. Thought it was a pretty good segment. That was a pretty good segment. And they are very much making you want to see Wheeler Yuta turn on John Moxley. Uh, yeah, I don't, I don't anticipate that one happening anytime soon, though. It's going to happen. I don't know about soon, but it's going to yeah. happen. We had uh, Kyle and Takeshita backstage when they made the challenge for Ricochet, which, thank God, they put that graphic up later because I listened to Takeshita about six times. I could not figure out who he was challenging. Ends up being Ricochet. We had Leo Rush and Arya Daivari, and, of course, Leo Rush got the win with a frog splash. Top Flight came out, celebrated with him afterwards. We had Lexis, or Lexi, with MXM Collection and Johnny TV. And man, the crowd just ate this segment up. Johnny tells them that they have it. They have it. And he says, if you ever want to collab, just slide into my DMs. And he slides off screen and the place laughs. And then they almost crack. And then they take their elevator down and the crowd went nuts. So it looks like Johnny TV and MXM are going to be a six-man. A six-man team. Hmm. There you go. So then we had Roderick Strong and Shane Taylor, and this was Roddy's first match in the three-match series, and they had, a, they had a pretty good match while it lasted, and Shane ends up clobbering him, but uh, he goes for a powerbomb, and Roddy slips out and hits a jumping knee, and he's knocked people out with this knee before, and I don't know if he knocked out Shane Taylor here, but Shane Taylor gets hit with his knee. He goes down. The ref counts two, but holds up his count. Shane does not kick out. And so the ref goes, that's it. It's over. And yeah. so I yeah. hope that dude's all right. Yeah. Um, it, uh, it didn't look, it, it, it looked, it looked like 
like the the ref like he didn't think that that was the finish, but um, yeah, I don't know. I didn't hear anything that like there was an injury or anything. I'll try and find out, but if there was, I think we need a new finish for Roderick Strong. I think that's yeah. safe to say. So then the main event was Anna Jay and Mariah May for the women's title. And uh, much like you missed the first hour, I got a lot of complaints. And in fact, it happened to me as well. Literally, as Tony Schiavone is screaming that the world champion is going out, DVR cut out. They went mm-hmm. long. And they went, they, they went, they went, well, I think they went about six minutes long, it felt like, or maybe, um, well, no, the actual match only went about 30 seconds longer. They just, oh. they missed the finish because they went oh. long. Okay. So, uh, I, it, I saw the finish. It was, it was based, well, she won. How did she win? Um, you tell me. Um, let me see. So, um, Mar- oh, Mariah May did the, um, she, uh, cradled her. That's what that's what happened. Cradled her and pinned her. Yeah, yeah. This match didn't have a lot of heat early. It kind of got uh, kind of a little bit after the break. They they kind of got the people a little bit, but you know this crowd was really up and down all night. Like there were certain things, like the Kyle Fletcher match. They were just going absolutely, absolutely, completely haywire. And I heard from people that went to the show that that was like you know had the most heat of anything by far. But there was other stuff on the show that uh, that didn't have a lot of heat. But hey, the show drew three thousand. And uh, Dynamite did 3,000 as well. So uh, both of those are, are up from uh, what they've been doing of late. So I don't know if that's solely because they're now advertising lots of matches in advance, but that certainly doesn't hurt. So Yeah. I mean, I looked at the advances. They're still very weak. So, I mean, there's, there's, that, that hasn't changed at all. Well, we do have a card for Wednesday. Of course, Wednesday is the head-to-head. So NXT yeah, has it's, got... It's, 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 it's a lot of stuff on that card. Well, NXT has Trick and Bubba versus Ethan and Rich Holland. Jada Parker versus Lola Vice with Don Marie as special referee. Roxanne, Cora, Fallon, JC, and Jasmine versus Jordan Grace, Kalani Jordan, Zaria, Julia, and Stephanie. So three matches announced thus far for NXT. And then for Dynamite... We have Adam Cole and Malachi Black, which is Adam Cole's second match. He has to win three to get MJF. Jericho, Big Bill, and Brian Keith versus Briscoe, O'Reilly, and Ishii in a fight without honor. Darby and Orange Cassidy versus Claudio and Pac. Patriarchy confronts Hook. We have Penelope Ford versus Jamie Hayter. Takeshita and Kyle Fletcher versus Rick Shea and TBA. And the entire Hurt Syndicate will appear on the show. That's Wednesday. So, yeah, that's uh, that's the show, and uh, we're going to wrap it up. We've got uh, New Observers up. The uh, show from Friday with Dave and Garrett is up as well, and Dave and I will be back on Monday after Raw to talk the rest of the weekend news and Raw and everything else from uh, Fallout from Crown Jewels. So that'll be that. Check out the front page for more, and that is it. We'll talk to you again after a while.